Welcome to Tech Talks by AdTech. I'm Shiny and I handle content for AdTech in India. We have a super interesting interview for you today. Joining me is Anuj Kumar, who is the co-founder and chief revenue and operating officer at Apple. Apple is a global technology company with over 15 years in the ad tech ecosystem. It is one of the key players in the country today and the only one to have gone public and delivering continued advertiser and shareholder returns. And we have Noelia Amodo, who is the CEO of MediaSmart, a leading self-serve programmatic mobile platform which is based out of Spain and has a great full footprint in Europe, LATAM and US markets. MediaSmart is now rapidly go growing into India and Southeast Asia after Apple's acquisition of it a few months ago. Welcome Noelia and welcome Anuj. Glad to have you on TikTok. First order of business, I think congratulations are in order because of the ac Apple's acquisition of MediaSmart. Uh, we've been following this news for a while and we're super excited to talk to you about this. Uh, and I think it, it's been a while since this has happened, but we've been waiting to talk to you about this and about the opportunities this brings to the market. I know there is a lot of opportunities for you guys and a lot of new products for the market. So uh, your take, you know, I, I'd like to ask this question to both of you. What are the opportunities and what are the new things that you bring to market with this acquisition and with this merger? Anuj, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll take that. I think uh, clearly, I think any kind of uh, coming together of two organizations, I think is a meeting of minds and meeting of visions. And I think that's what we have seen uh, with the Media Smart team. And uh, I think taking a business lens in terms of what it means, I think there are various areas because Apple, as uh, many of you would know, obviously we've been in the ad tech space for over 15 plus years. And we've built multiple platforms within the company. And I think where we see Media Smart fitting in is uh, very, very complementing in terms of how it fits in into what all Apple is doing. And uh, I would actually want to delve upon three core areas, which I feel, which is personally excited uh, many of us who've been involved uh, uh, with uh, Media Smart in terms of ensuring that we can align and grow together. So I think the first one is really around, uh, like if you look at Apple, Apple's largest strength today comes in in terms of the DMP, which audience, which Apple has built out, which is helping us build audience intelligence, which is leveraged by advertisers globally and with India being the largest market. Now, if you take the India market lens, Apple historically, Apple's DMP would have data of around 500 million plus device IDs. And what is that data? That data is largely around the online consumption habits of people. In terms of what they're doing on the mobile device, what they, uh, what kind of products they buy, what kind of uh, content they view, what kind of apps they have, that's the kind of data which is around how the person is living his life on the mobile device. And what we found in Media Smart was that Media Smart, while it's a fully programmatic platform, the area of strength Media Smart had chosen was largely around building a lot more offline persona of individuals based on where they, where the phone is, where the person is residing. And our view was that if we could blend the online and offline persona of individuals, then we can offer to advertisers a much better stack in terms of how they can reach out to audiences which are most relevant. To them. So I think clearly one from the product standpoint that I feel is a perfect marriage with the kind of strengths uh, which uh, both uh, Apple and Media Smart had. I think the other area which is also very, very uh, significant is that if you look at Apple's business, Apple's business largely and uh, given that now we are a public company, we keep talking a lot about our business. Our business is largely around uh, cost per converted user, which is largely around uh, allowing advertisers to drive conversions. And these conversions could be new users or repeat conversions from the advertiser. And uh, so if you look at from the entire funnel of advertising, conversion is the most bottom funnel event which is where you are measuring the impact of advertising, which it is having on the end. In some cases, the end product is the same. So the conversion is that, whereas a lot of media smart advertising is top and middle funnel. And if you look at advertisers today, advertisers have both the challenges. At one end, they need to build a greater brand, which is really a top funnel activity. And obviously they need to do it in a programmatic world with the right targeting. So if you can marry the top funnel strengths of top and middle funnel strengths of media smart with the bottom funnel strengths of what Apple's existing CPCU platforms have, 
I think again, there is something which uh, very, very meaningful and much bigger, which we can do together. And uh, the third area, which uh, personally has uh, been a big area of excitement, I think is around uh, new technologies, which Media Smart has been working with. And Media Smart clearly as a company has been one of the leaders in uh, programmatic advertising in markets like uh, Europe and uh, the US. And uh, I think one of the areas which is the trend which we have seen in more developed markets is how consumers are doing a lot more uh, content consumption on uh, connected TV kind of screens. And uh, we are seeing same trends happening in emerging markets and India is leading the flag from there. And I think the current pandemic has obviously led much more where TV content was not as easily accessible. A lot more people have moved in on uh, OTT kind of content, which is watched on smart TVs. So connected TV as a space, there is enough and more new things which Media Smart has been doing, I think, which is very, very exciting. And we believe that for the advertising landscape in India and also for the rest of Asian markets, this is still early days for connected TV. And uh, Media Smart has a significant head start in what they have done. And uh, now what we can bring it together, I think, is uh, very, very exciting times. So super excited about uh, many of these synergies, which I think is, uh, and we're just at the starting point of that. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate that this entire uh, engagement uh, between Media Smart and Apple also happened pretty much at the start of the pandemic. <laughs> I think, uh, but uh, I think we've done a great job in terms of ensuring collaboration on Zoom and any other collaboration tools and looking forward to a much greater phase of collaboration going forward. Absolutely. I think, Anuj, uh, really exciting times for you and for the industry, mm -hmm. I would say. Because one view I know has been a challenge, marrying offline to online, performance marketing is really big this year. So I think we are right on track then, Noelia. I'm very excited about this. Noelia, how excited are you about this? And what, what do you think are the opportunities that you foresee in your market and mm -hmm. in the media market? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping also we can see each other in person soon because as, as Anuj was saying, this has been very digital, totally socially distanced. Um, well, it, beyond the products, uh, of course, uh, that, that, that really excite me, uh, I, I would say I'm excited about our possibilities together because of other reasons as well. There is, uh, there is uh, first of all, a, a complementary uh, geographical focus, right? So our, our, uh, our company, as Anuj was saying, was more focused in EMEA, uh, US and Latin America, whereas Apple is obviously stronger in, in emerging markets and, and in particular in Asia, right? So I feel like now uh, we, can, we can, as a combined entity, be present in, in many more uh, markets. Um, and also, so far in this, uh, you know, almost uh, nine years, <laughs> we had been uh, in our journey, we had been very successful at developing very innovative uh, technical uh, solutions, but with a very small team for my taste, right? <laughs> We're a very uh, small organization. And thanks to uh, the synergies with Apple, uh, we, we can now bring our solutions to a much bigger uh, customer base, right? So that is really excited because you one is really proud of their baby, right? And they wanted to, grow as much as possible and I feel together uh, we can we can we can do it and I feel that that um, momentum for growth uh, can be there thanks to all our cultural feats so that was very important uh, for me at the time of the uh, acquisition and for the whole media smart team because uh, we we sort of share the same culture at a core right I mean both of our companies were we're built uh, on on very sound financials. We've, we've always wanted growth, but profitable growth. Uh, we're both very innovative and, and very collaborative, right? And that is important uh, to, to really uh, take advantage of the synergies, execute well, and, and, and bring that growth forward. Because without that cultural uh, fit, fit, I feel, uh, you know, you, you can hit a lot more bumps on the road. So. Uh, so I'm confident and I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to us being bigger in Asia, that's for sure. <laughs> it sounds like a marriage of like minds. I'm really liking it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so any conversation this year, and this is true for every conversation that I've had, whether it be, you know, formal like this or just a phone call is we're talking about how the consumer is changing and 
how trends and you know a lot of things that we expected people to do maybe in 2025 they're doing right now and the pandemic or you know whatever challenges of 2020 have been have brought about this change anuj do you want to talk a little bit more about this and you know because of these changing consumer habits do you see uh, any opportunities that marketers can really take advantage of so i think from a consumer lens i think uh, this year uh, given some of the unfortunate events which have happened around us i think has led to a massive change in terms of how consumers are adapting to technology and i think i'll take an india lens given that we are talking uh, in india right now so i think if you look at from an india lens i think april was also the period where pretty much everything was locked down and uh, a lot of people like in india if you see that a lot of people were that we have around 500 600 million smartphone users but we only have around uh, till last year we had only around 100 million people who were shopping online so i think that's one thing which is changing dramatically that sometimes while there was a natural growth momentum it was on and it would have anyway grown in 2020 but i think a lot of that has been fast tracked with the pandemic and sometimes people avoiding going out and preferring online transactions so i think that's clearly from a user perspective i think that's something which is seeing a significant change and i think that's not just for buying but that's for pretty much everything education and uh, gaming i think kind of areas which were still but were always considered booming areas from the indian or asian economy the kind of growth they have seen in the last 6 uh, or months i think has been unprecedented so i think those are clearly consumer trends that there are many many new categories which have emerged which are digitally first categories which would have possibly reached the stage which they have today maybe taken 2 years to reach and they have done it within 6 months and i think which is quite evident with the way many of these companies have been raising capital growing so i think that's a big uh, ecosystem change which is happening the second ecosystem change which i see from a consumer lens is really around how consumers are moving from uh, linear tv entertainment to connected tv and i think that's a big big change i think uh, like uh, i think so many people who are largely and i think this also got triggered because if you look at it april may was also the period when people were stuck at home everybody wanted more entertainment and uh, somehow the tv channels which were there which were a regular channels of linear tv entertainment were not producing new content so a lot of people so while we had the early adapters who had already moved into the otts i think we had a lot more greater surge of consumers coming in on ott and connected tv as the device to uh, access that content driven just by need because you want to be entertained and that's the only place where there is a repository of content which you haven't watched and it's available on demand so i think uh, that again is a key area and i think that to me is also impacting how digital advertising is going on because today if you see that while these are ecosystem changes from the advertising landscape if you look at it it's clearly evident that these are also the categories which are driving growth for the ad economy because if you look at any stats clearly there is challenges which is from the overall growth but if you put the stats on a digital you wear just a digital hat or you wear a hat for categories which are benefiting from these kind of situations that's where the growth is happening and i think those categories are growing uh, tremendously i think the other area is that uh, some of these categories are also evolving what they are doing on marketing and uh, that's where blending because it, because these are all brands which have been born in the last year and at one end they need to invest in building that brand because you take a sector like edtech there are 10 companies odd who are well funded chasing this like everybody has some different proposition but many of them overlap and they're chasing a similar customer base so you need to build a brand and at the same time invest in performance marketing to get uh, roi so i think a lot of challenges around working with platforms which can blend both uh, objectives which is uh, clearly uh, because that's not the challenge which the e-commerce industry faced because e-commerce industry did a lot of brand building they had almost 5 years to take off and while they are benefiting today they are not born today but some of these industries are in a way like they born or matured in this era and i think that's where uh, there is a lot of excitement and change happening in terms of how consumers are moving and obviously wherever consumers move the ad dollars move and it's impacting how ad dollars are also moving absolutely uh, i completely agree with you we have 
so many brands who are moving towards these, you know, even ancient or legacy brands, I would say, are moving towards this B2C model. And of course, we have so many homegrown brands now, which are new, which were born this year or last year. And we've been speaking to a lot of them. Uh, and it's absolutely fantastic to see the kind of strategies they use. You also spoke about connected TV, uh, Anuj. I think that's a wonderful opportunity. Noelia, do you, and let me come to Noelia with a question about this. Uh, can you, you know, tell me how would you compare linear TV buying or linear TV with connected TV? And what are the major differences? Uh, how would you measure linear TV versus uh, connected TV? Or I would say, how do you measure connected television versus mm -hmm. linear TV? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, well, that, uh, if you allow me, it's a, a very good question that I'm eager to answer, but I, if you allow me, I, I, I'd like to first uh, define some concepts, right? Because one, one of the things I found is that this ecosystem can be very confusing. Uh, it can be very confusing in everything, but even when it comes to connected TV, depending on what you read, you know, different people call different things the same way and, and, and have different names for what I think is the same thing. So uh, I'm going to tell you what, what Connected TV is for us, um, right? Because it may be different from uh, for, for other companies. So um, for us, Connected TV is, uh, let's say, the device, right? And it, it, the, the big screen where you consume your content. And that can be what we call a smart TV, which is a TV that is itself connected to the internet or it can be a TV that is connected to the internet through another device, let's say a setup box, right? But you consume the content in the, big, in the big screen, right? And that is different from OTT, although in some cases I also see them used interchangeably, right? Uh, because for us, OTT is more the delivery method or, or methodology. So uh, content that is delivered over the internet, right? Whether it is, uh, on demand or, or streamed, uh, but that OTT content can not only be consumed on the big screen of the TV, it can also be con consumed in an app on your phone or on your tablet or even on your desktop, right? Um, so that's an important distinction to make because when I talk about what connected TV means for us, I wanna make sure it's, it's clear. And then I there is the- I appreciate that, yeah, appreciate yeah. that because uh, connected TV is clearly new to India. And a lot of people may have different definitions for it. So yeah, thank you. And it's not that it's necessarily, maybe I'm wrong. Huh? It's not that it's necessarily right or wrong, but we know what we're talking about, right? Um, and then linear TV versus connected TV. Linear TV uh, is, is a TV where the content comes from an antenna or from cable, uh, right? So, um, so, um, you know, you, you get what you get and you cannot get it on demand, right? It's only broadcast, broadcasted uh, uh, to everybody. Whereas in a connected TV, the content is uh, coming from the internet, right? And, and it can be either streamed or consumed on, device, on demand, right? So that's the big difference from, uh, I guess, the end user perspective. From an advertising perspective, the way you buy advertising on linear TV is very different from the way you do it on connected TV because on linear TV, you're tied to the programming, right? When you do media planning on linear TV, you're thinking about what shows do I want to advertise on, right? But somebody watching that show will get your ad and everybody watching that show will get your ad. Um, connected TV is completely different in that it can be bought programmatically. Right, and following the same methodology that you use to buy other types of digital advertising. And uh, that is great because it, it, it allows you to take advantage of or take the best of both worlds, right? You can advertise in a medium uh, like the big screen that is uh, uh, clearly better to tell stories, to build brand awareness, uh, but you can do so while taking advantage of everything that uh, programmatic brings to the table, right? You can uh, make sure your ads are relevant uh, for your audience because you're, again, buying in real time. You're buying those impacts or, or, or those uh, impressions in real time. So you can make your ads relevant um, and uh, you can generate engagement and you can track, right? But after my class, I guess maybe I can give you some examples. <laughs> Uh, because everything is better understood with, with examples, I think. So, so on connected TV, 
some of the things that you could do that you couldn't do on linear TV is, um, let's say, uh, serve an ad to a particular household where you know there is a client of yours that has bought your products, but a different ad to households where uh, nobody has ever bought your products, right? You may want to have a, a different conversation with both. Obviously, this is predicated on the fact that the advertiser has the right first party data to do that, but maybe we can talk about that on a, on a separate question. You can um, serve a, an ad to a particular household where you know there's students living uh, and a different ad to other uh, households where uh, maybe people that work in the finance space live, right? Or you can serve different ads depending on the area of the city the household is on. So I could go on and on with examples, but the, the main point is that you can target audiences, right? Uh, and uh, you can, in that way, follow the same methodology you follow in programmatic advertising for, for um, uh, other channels. Uh, it's, it's, it's slightly different uh, when it comes to the algorithms behind because you need to do some cross screen stuff. They're more sophisticated, but the, the methodology is, is basically the same. Um, and also you can generate engagement, um, right? So for example, at Media Smart, we have this household sync uh, solution uh, that allows you to serve an ad on TV and then follow up with ads on uh, other devices that people in that household uh, have, right? So I can see an ad on TV and within an hour, see another ad uh, for the same brand, brand on, my, on my tablet or on my phone. It can be the same video or uh, reach media uh, that I can actually uh, click on and engage, right? And the advertiser can, can measure that engagement. So as an advertiser, you ca you're not only uh, you know, creating more of an impact, uh, with with your message and making sure uh, your brand sticks, but uh, but you're also generating that bi-directional communication, right? You can get the user engaged, which is also something that in traditional linear TV you couldn't do. It was pretty much one way, uh, and you can track and you know then even uh, optimize based on on what you're tracking, right? So it's it's quite different and better, I would say. <laughs> So it definitely sounds like an amazing gateway for all your traditional TV buyers or finding it difficult to come into digital and feel that, oh, no, digital is too difficult. But this is probably like a base for them, you know, kind of start with something they know and move into digital. Right. right. Awesome. Awesome. And I really love the stuff you talk about retargeting to different devices from that original ad that you saw. Mm -hmm. So I know it's coming to you and, and you mentioned something similar to this. You said that you know, there are people who are online and there are people who are offline and user behavior is kind of hybrid and seamlessly moving between these two. However, most, most uh, brands and most uh, marketeers that I speak with find it very difficult to kind of you know, marry these two behaviors. So I see an ad and then you know, I may act on it, go into a store and purchase something. They have no way to connect these two. Are, are, are you guys working on anything that can actually marry or create like a one view of the advertiser, uh, you know, one view of the consumer for a marketer and make it simple for them to track across online and offline because uh, I, you know, we had a small conversation about this. Well, I'd love to hear more about this. Very, very relevant point. I think uh, if you look at assets, like I'll talk about the customer journey first because largely how customers are engaging with technology or their shopping is what uh, the way the advertiser needs to target them. And if you look at it today, out of all the connected devices which you have, possibly the phone is the only one which you're carrying to the shopping mall, even when you're going out there. And if you look at the interaction, now while I'm there, imagine I'm there in the mall, I'm still on the phone checking out products which are there, go on to a shop, I choose a product offline, I go on to the payment counter and then there is a QR code, I again scanned it on my phone and pay it like that. So within, while I have shopped offline, I have actually created a digital footprint of what I have shot. Because A, I searched and looked for products, looked for prices. I also went and paid. And which is very, very unique because what's happening is that every physical transaction in today's day and age, or not every is possibly an exaggeration, but a bulk of the physical transactions in today's day and age have a digital footprint. And uh, the same thing can also happen digitally because digitally also when you're buying products digitally, it doesn't mean that you can't check products offline. You might, and offline could also have different meanings. You get an ad in newspaper, you scan it, you get it on, you go onto the app, you buy it there. So there are multiple mediums 
interacting before a customer is making a purchase decision. Now, historically, what uh, we have seen is that most marketers have looked at these two as isolated customer journeys. So there are companies which are online first companies who say that, okay, you know what, I'm an e-commerce company. If you can help me reach out to people who are transacting on e-commerce, I'm ready to pay a premium and advertise to these people. Similarly, somebody who's running a retail outlet, he's looking at more, maybe looking at digital, but looking at digital from a very different lens versus an e-commerce company. Now, given that the entire layer is connected so well, I think today, and I think that's the first point which I was making, which excited us most about Apple and Media Smart coming together, because Apple's strength largely lay on the digital footprint of customers. Whereas Media Smart strength, because Media Smart obviously one of the core strengths of the platform is around the concept of uh, location and proximity. So lay on the offline behavior of people. And what we are now offering to advertisers is the blended view of the advertiser. So if you want to target, say, a FMCG or a CPG brand wants to target a high-end shampoo, now their high-end shampoo obviously could be bought on the top e-commerce portals, could well be picked up at the shop. Now, for them, it's important and they don't really care till the time the shampoo is selling that whether I picked it up from an Amazon or a DMART. For them, it's the same. And uh, I think that's where the blended journey that where because of the blended journey, I can allow advertisers that now you can actually create customer cohorts. That these are say women who are interested in e-commerce and say reside in a high-end apartment complex, which possibly is a surrogate of the purchasing power and are using say the latest version of Android or the iOS devices. So they can build multiple layers, which are layers based on the online footprint. So your e-commerce shopper or women is more online footprint your place of residence is on uh, offline. You could also layer that, okay, these are people who might have visited malls in the last one week and layer that data. And that data layering is what we believe as a key differentiation, which uh, we are offering to advertisers right now. And we see a significant uptake because that's not the, like the advertisers intuitively know that the customer journey has changed and blended between uh, what's online and what's offline. But the advertising landscape hadn't, and I think thankfully we are uh, having something which should appeal to uh, many, many more uh, than what uh, uh, are already leveraging it because clearly it makes intuitive sense. Absolutely. Anuj, and you talk about data layering and the mobile phone being the key to, you know, uh, reaching out to these people and, you know, understanding these behaviors because that's the device we have at home and that's the device we're carrying to the shopping mall. Uh, so do you want to also, and, and most of these behaviors are being targeted through apps and because I am paying through an app and I'm doing contactless dining through an app and I'm doing these multiple things offline and online. So do you want to talk a little bit about the trends in app marketing that you're seeing or, you know, app consumption that you're seeing in 2020 and uh, what are the opportunities that marketers have here? You know, what can they really, you know, use uh, that to kind of kick off their business in a better way in 2021? Perfect. I think it's a spot on question basis what the customer trends are right now. So I think if you look at today, the India is actually a very unique market that A, we are a mobile first market, clearly for internet. Bulk of internet has been consumed on mobile devices and bulk of it within mobile devices has been consumed on apps. Now, what is really amazing is that even if you look at from a landscape point of view, we would also be the country with the most number of app downloads happening across uh, at least the Google Play Store, which is 97% of India is kind of Android. So that's the uh, store which defines or the, uh, the, uh, the other Android uh, app stores like Indus and all would largely drive all of that. And uh, if you look at it, so the app economy is where the growth is and pretty much any service which you are engaging with, whether you're buying products, you're buying services, you're, whether you're getting a haircut or calling a carpenter or buying a phone or like pretty, or meeting a school teacher or doing a call like this, most of us are using our mobile devices for that. And uh, I think that's where the app economy obviously has seen the most uh, significant growth over the last few years. And obviously many of those categories have seen greater growth in the last six months. And if you look at today for app marketing, I think there are multiple 
while there is growth and whenever there is growth there is opportunity there is also evolution which is happening on app marketing so i think there are few areas which i see as emerging trends within the app marketing landscape i think one which is very very particular to india which is that app marketing in is in india is not limited to google play because india is also a market which has got multiple app stores which are oem uh built app stores or experiences which are integrated within the handset so the app economy is larger than what is defined on the traditional uh, os driven app stores so i think that's one uh, area and for certain categories that becomes disproportionately larger because they see the early internet movers be being more uh, within those kind of app store environments versus the traditional uh, itunes or uh, google play so i think that's one thing which is unique to india second from an app marketing point of view i think uh, what i even mentioned earlier is the entire concept of the full funnel marketing which is uh, creating awareness of the app which is largely all what you're doing on the mobile phone itself and driving transactions so you need to have all the activities happening together and while you're doing that what you need to also be aware is that given that this industry has grown very fast this industry also has its own challenges around uh, uh, fraud around ad fraud and clearly how do you mitigate that and one thing which we see as an emerging area how customers are evolving their app marketing is because earlier customers were largely looking at roi measurement that i spent 100 if i got 150 i'm happy that's roi for me or whatever they defined as roi different uh, metrics uh, were defined i think now what's happening is that most marketers are evolving that they are wanting to identify the incrementality of each channel because roi itself sometimes could be that you're deriving greater roi but that's largely because those users were kind of semi organic like somebody who's already showing intent for your product who's searching for your product if he's converting through an ad for a lot of those people who have searched they don't even know what's the difference of a paid link and a uh, organic search and uh, that's where uh, the roi looks higher because the guy or the person who's looking for it is already in the purchase cycle so i think incrementality obviously becomes a uh, very very important because most advertisers are using multiple channels for communication and traditionally how they were measuring incrementality was that they would switch off one channel and then see what is the impact it has had on my uh, rois i think now i think especially on the media smart platform i think we built a lot of algorithms for real time incrementality measurement and i think that we see as very very important for marketers where they can see how each channel is adding value and uh, increasingly we see a greater interest within app marketers from moving to from only roi metrics to incrementality metrics so one trend obviously which i mentioned uh, in terms of which is more around the alternate app stores which is an india specific trend second is the full funnel marketing which is very very important third which is the incrementality in addition to only roi measurement and the fourth area is even for app marketing looking at offline signals and today we have advertisers and who you would feel that these advertisers like think of it as an online entertainment company they are looking for advertising on the mobile device they should be using a lot of signals of your digital behavior but they also want to use offline behavior signals because they say a lot about what your interests might lie in and uh, that is where uh, we are seeing that even for the app marketing community many of them like some are intuitive categories like a grocery category would want to look at offline signals because their products might be available and they would want to okay put me a geo targeted campaign which is only for this uh, sector in a particular city but even beyond that your uh, location and your behavior of where you go is uh, if somebody is more frequently visiting airports is he the right kind of audience for a particular show on an ott versus somebody who's visiting say schools and if you can differentiate that that offline signal becomes important for app marketing so i think those are all changes and uh, evolutions which we are seeing right now which are very very interesting uh, especially in the largest app market in the world great i think those are a lot of exciting opportunities in store and noelia i understand that whatever i must spoke right now and we're all excited to try this out but all this is available through our big keywords for 2020 which is programmatic and data 
So mm-hmm. I want to ask you, with the advertising world moving increasingly programmatic, a lot of people also bringing this in-house, how important is uh, data ownership really for an agency or for an advertiser? And oh, for an agency and advertiser, yes, from a user perspective also, how important is to you know, keep that privacy safeguarded? What's your take on that? Yeah, well, uh, well, data is, is, is key, clearly, and, uh, and, and it has a lot of value. I alluded to it in my first example that I, that I mentioned for Connected TV, but it applies, it applies to anything because if, if, you have, uh, if you have good data, you, you know your audience when you're advertising to them and you can, you can speak to them with a relevant message, right? And that, that would ultimately drives uh, and maximizes the impact of your advertising, which is what everybody's looking for. So, um, and, and, uh, and, and because it is important and, and has so much value, you should uh, definitely own it as an advertiser. Uh, because if not, and if you don't learn and you don't gather data from any advertising budgets you have, then you're leaving a lot of value on the table, right? You're, you're, you're sort of buying the immediate stuff, but not investing in your future, if you will. Now, um, the challenge is, um, is, of course, making those ads as relevant as possible, which you can do when you gather a lot of data. Uh, but do so in a way that is respectful of the user privacy, because uh, I mean we believe that that that, that is key. Um, for better or for worse, we um, developed our technology in Europe, and uh, in Europe, uh, end user privacy has been at the for I mean at the forefront of of all conversations in everything digital, right? Even before. I'm sure you're familiar with GDPR, even if it doesn't affect you as the, yeah. the regulation that came out in 2018, right? Even before that, there were there was strict regulation around cookies and uh, MediaSmart pretty much since its inception um, has been self-regulating uh, when it when it came to 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 privacy. And that's that's what actually helped us uh, uh, sail smoothly through uh, the the GDPR uh, changes that uh, that came right. So, um, so we do care a lot about privacy, and we're we're very proud of of bringing to advertisers a solution that um, that empowers them, um, but empowers them through tools and a platform that is uh, designed with a privacy first approach. And what does what does uh, this mean? It means that whenever we're developing, whether it is a big new solution or a small new feature, um, uh, we, we ask ourselves the question, you know, how can we do this uh, in a way that brings the most value to the advertiser, but also keeps uh, customer privacy, right? And, and the design that comes after that is, is, is a result of asking ourselves that question. Um, it is through this approach that we've come up with a, Footfall measurement solution that can measure uh, footfall in real time, incremental footfall in real time, uh, but without keeping track of where every user is in every uh, second, right? Which would, you know, not uh, keep their privacy. Or how I was mentioning earlier, our household sync solution for connected TV and ads, we're also able to do that without keeping a detailed user graph, right? We we try as much as possible to keep user privacy, and then of course whenever we do gather personal information is always with the user consent and kept in a secure way. So um, advertisers uh, uh, should definitely, or that would be my advice, gather as much data as possible, gather it with, with platforms that, uh, that uh, do gather user consent, right? So, so the, 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 uh, the data about the, the end user should, should only come once that, uh, that user um, has provided the, the, the consent. In Europe also, we're, we're uh, ahead uh, in that area. And for example, together, um, uh, precise location, you need an extra opt-in of the user and, and, and stuff like that. So, so you should definitely safeguard privacy, but also um, take advantage of, of, of the data where, where the user has consented, right? Because again, uh, it will help your advertising initiatives be so much more effective um, uh, down the line. So, uh, I guess I, I hope I answered your, your question. Yeah, we, yeah. we do, we, we do respect privacy because it's the right thing to do. Uh, but also I think if you look at 
trends, and we've been talking in this interview a lot about trends, it's clear that uh, that uh, every country is adhering to privacy regulations sooner or later, right? It's, it's a trend that is that is non-stoppable. Apple also following uh, uh, the same the same uh, track. So so. We, we feel we're lucky we took this on early on because uh, and, and keeping this this privacy first approach will make our solutions a lot more durable in the market, right? So uh, because when new regulation comes out, yeah, we already are compliant with GDPR, with CCPA. Okay, bring it on. You know, our 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 solutions uh, should be able to stand the test. So we think it was the right approach strategically also. Absolutely. I think self-regulation is the way to go. So if I can put it in two lines, I'd say data is oil and consent is gold. Absolutely gold yep. standard. For <laughs> Great. I think I think that's in, that's very interesting. And Anuj, I want to come to you with a question about this on the same thing. So we are on the brink of a GDPR. We we have data laws in place. We have uh, the cookie less world coming. So a cookie less browser coming, which everyone is scared about. Um, mm -hmm. But and so, and, you know, like, like Noelia said, you know, consent is gold. It's important to have the right data. It's important to have data that users are aware that we're using that data. Now, when it comes to that, what, how do you see this data usage? How has it evolved in the last 10 years? And one more thing that I wanted to ask you is that I saw this fantastic ad by Mondelez uh, a couple of days ago about Diwali and how they recreated this, you know, uh, proximity marketing and personalization at a huge scale. So if we are talking about data uh, in the form of first party data or consensual data, is it possible to create that kind of scale? So two questions really, how do you see data evolve, has evolved, data usage has evolved in the last 10 years? And how can we create scale if we are talking about only first party data or if you're talking about, you know, sets of data where there is, you know, where there has to be consent and there has to be self-regulation and laws to be followed. How do you create scale then? So I think uh, multiple parts of your question, I'll try and uh, take a few of them. I think if you look at data, so I think if I take the, I think Noelia talked about how Media Smart as a platform has largely been built with a privacy first structure uh, as a platform philosophy and also given that some of the markets Media Smart was operating in, they were also where the privacy uh, regulations were the strongest. I think if I wear the Apple lens, because our business has largely been more in Asia, I think privacy as a concept has been very close to our hearts. And uh, I think even when we, like the first patent Apple had was around consumer acceptable advertising. And this was a patent which was filed almost 15 years ago, or, uh, which is like, pretty much in the start of Apple's journey. Mm. And I think that's where we believe that for any advertising to be impactful, it has to be consented and it has to add value to you. And I think as a company, I think that's been something which has been driving what we've been doing. And even when India, even right now, is still evolving in terms of its privacy laws, I know that we are almost at the final stage of uh, some of these things coming in. But even before that, given that... Uh, we were working across multiple markets. I think we were always looking at how is it that we can get accreditation because we saw that that was an area of strength for us. Because when there is no regulation, you also have a lot of people who are abusing that data. And uh, we saw that happening around and we said that, okay, can we use this as our comparative strength to win greater trust from large companies who see this as a problem, even though there might not be any local regulations. And I think that's where some of the overall initiatives which we did, whether it's about getting accredited by the Singapore government, which is possibly the first uh, uh, region which had the uh, PDP, which is the Personal Data Protection Act, and using some of those uh, principles to build out our DMP, I think has been uh, very, very critical to what we are doing. And I think even right now, as we go and build out on uh, programmatic, now on programmatic, you have many ways in which you can leverage data. And that data is also both uh, first party and third party. And I think we see value in both and uh, third party, but clearly if you're taking data from the audience, then it has to be consented. And wherever there is unconsented data happening, I think largely most uh, regulations are going against that. Any data which is coming in with user consent, nobody really has a problem. 
and uh, i think first party data that way is a huge gold mine because that's largely what is coming in completely with user content because the user is sharing that because they want a better experience i share with an app what is my favorite music because i want that music app to recommend me songs which i like now that's very very important insight and as a consumer many of these music apps i am an active user and i love when they curate playlists for me and that's largely based on what i am listening and it's also based on what information i gave them in the first place which made them build some audience persona around me now if that first party data is making advertising more meaningful that's something which users also would find value because they have consented to part with that data and i think that is where our focus largely is right now that clearly looking at user consent as being the driver for all the innovations which we build out doing a lot of work directly with the large advertisers where we can blend their first party data assets together with third party and uh, i think the big advantage which markets like india also offer is that while there is a lot of things which are happening on uh, cookie there are things which are happening on idfa i think one thing which we need to take realize in the india market is india is largely app economy which is android app economy so clearly while uh, obviously some of these things are happening the android app economy is something where uh, uh, you still have the identifier which again is user consented because the the gaid is something which the user can reset at any time and that is where as a dmp company we have always have a challenge that we need to keep recency of data into account because the a the handset changes and b uh, the device id gets reset so i think those are important areas and uh, going back to the example which you pointed out even i had seen that ad uh, which was recently uh, got a lot of social media mentions in india and to me it's a great example of how offline data has been used to augment an online advertising campaign and i think that's a great example of what we have talked about for a large part of what we have covered today that those worlds are blending and some people are using that data to uh, creatively customize their message and some are using it to creatively customize targeting some are using it to creatively drive engagement and largely speaking what is good advertising it's a great message told to the right person which is having some call to action which is measurable and uh, if you can blend the three and in all three earlier creative was kept out of data and i think the example which you pointed out i think is a great example of creativity being enhanced uh, with data insights and with the uh, ai algorithms uh, doing multiple creatives based on user location absolutely it was a it was a beautiful ad and a beautiful message overall noelia i don't know if you saw that ad but we can send it to you if you haven't uh so this was done by mondelez the chocolate manufacturer and with the festive season coming around in india it was like absolutely the right kind of message that we were all looking for mm. uh so we understand that a, a lot of these capabilities and a lot of way that mondelez was able to do this kind of pinpointed targeting and dynamic advertising uh all this is kind of available only through programmatic platforms and that's the way to do this uh now a lot of advertisers that i spoke to and in 2020 especially are trying to build these capabilities in house which is great so you know they're trying to move away from that agency model they're trying to you know teach uh, you know create a, a specialized team for programmatic marketing which can kind of you know handle this entire piece solo by themselves do you think that makes sense do you think uh the programmatic journey is something that it makes sense to walk alone or you know should be still be working with multiple partners because there's so much more to explore there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well I, i well i think it's it's difficult to give an answer to everybody right because each advertiser lives their own world and what may make sense for some may not make sense for others uh so i'm i'm, I'm not going to answer that directly but <laughs> uh i think what does make sense is is for advertisers to understand and and control this technology right that that absolutely makes sense because uh if you don't understand it first of all you can be taken advantage of right it's it's uh, there there's so much at stake that you need to understand what's going on then whether you want to you know um build a team in house and then you know 
uh, uh, license a DSP or build your own from scratch or whether you want to have an outsource team that actually you know manages those platforms for you that that totally depends on the specific case but I think um, that understanding and control is is what is important, and we have seen that trend for sure in in, in Europe, in the U.S. of of uh, what is called in housing, right? Um, and and uh, we're prepared for it. Uh, I don't know if it's lack or an amazingly smart strategic decision at the beginning of our career, but <laughs> at Media Smart, but our our our, our full console. Um, a web application is built on top of an API and that API is open to to advertisers so it's very easy to um, to to um, you know use our, our our platform at a lower level if you want to you know do your own cost customers and integrate with your own tech stuff so so we're well positioned for that trend coming uh, so we would like to see more and more advertisers uh, doing in housing but I think uh, for an advertiser, I would also be careful if, if I'm allowed to be so, to, to give some advice. And what do you say about, you know, going alone? I don't think you can ever do this completely alone because, I mean, there are companies fully focused with a bunch of people on just doing one small piece, right? <laughs> uh, I think you should always try and build on, uh, step on somebody else's shoulders if you want to be effective and and and, and have that time to market. So for me, there is a there is a nice balance, right? You you uh, if you want to have again that control and uh, of the technology, maybe there are things you need to customize and things you need to integrate with that 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 fit your business, right? But you shouldn't try and reinvent the wheel, right? Because I mean, there's a lot of complexity in the programmatic space. I mean, if the amount of algorithms in in our team just to manage the you know. The amount of bid requests per second that uh, that our system manages and make that match with the campaigns you have. And, I mean, every small piece of the architecture has a lot of work behind. And as an advertiser, I mean, honestly, that 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 may be more of a command. It doesn't bring additional value to you specifically, right? To build it on your own, and you can get lost in uh, you know reinventing a lot of wheels. Um, so you should you should definitely have that control and understanding whether then you hire a team to manage it or you outsource to another team. You should do whatever customization and integration with your own systems uh, that is required with your own reporting, with your own, of course, first party data. And you should you should try and, and keep that balance when you think about what to build versus uh, versus uh, what to license, uh, I think. Right. I don't know if I answered absolutely. your question. Absolutely. No, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. So build the right capabilities, uh, and but you know, uh, you know, work with the right partners. Do not do not walk alone. And I think exactly, exactly. I, I, and I also think there is the risk. There is the risk of getting lost of you know reinventing a lot of things that do not bring value. That has an impact in time also, right? You can set up a team, start developing, and then. You know, maybe you're able to launch something in two years. <laughs> That's not what you want. So, uh, being a little uh, selfish here, uh, putting Media Smart's message forward. But I think one of the the things that our platform brings to the table is that you do have the capabilities to access APIs, to integrate, and to customize. Right. For the long run, while at the same time you have a console and a product that is readily available. Right. So it may help you manage that time to market. So you can you know, start running your business with a big degree of control uh, right away while you in parallel continue uh, you know, doing more customization in the long run. Absolutely, I think uh, that makes total sense. And a, a lot of these partners that we work with, Anuja, are agencies and trading desks so actively embracing programmatic. Uh, so what would your advice to them be? That's a tough one. At least I've seen the advertising landscape evolve significantly over the last few years. I think I've been part of that landscape pre-Apple and as Apple, uh, obviously been very actively engaged with the agency community over the last 15, 16 years. And I think clearly, I think one area which has seen the most significant amount of growth within all agencies right now is digital and programmatic. And Every agency group, if you look at it today, has been doing exceptional work on how they are leveraging programmatic. But if I was to answer your question, areas which I feel 
there is still room to do more and get better on i think i'll try and recap four or five which come top of mind to me which i think uh, should be quite valuable i think one which i see is that there is an overarching uh, dependence which a lot of agencies have which is on the walled gardens and uh, that i feel that is a significant challenge because within the walled gardens clearly the data ownership is neither with the advertiser nor with the agency so the walled gardens are making you dependent where you are building every customer segment every customer cohort there and reusing it between the two platforms and uh, while it's the easiest uh, way to advertise but i think from a long term lens clearly we believe that advertiser or whether directly or through their agency because agency is also an extended arm of the advertiser they need to own that asset and i think that's a very very important point and i am started seeing some of the larger global advertisers wanting to build out their own dmp cdp stacks wanting to move spends away from the wall gardens because there is enough and more uh, ways in which you can connect with consumers but have own the intelligence around who has seen your ad who is engaged with it who has clicked who has bought and that is the gold mine of information and uh, as noelia also said earlier you're leaving a lot on the table if you're not questioning that so i think that over dependence on wall gardens i think needs to be questioned and needs to be questioned by all agency groups with the point of view of data and i think data ownership becomes a uh, very very important I think the second area which I see is that, especially from an India lens, I think a lot of companies which are data-driven DMP companies or even agencies building their own data stacks have largely done it on cookies. And if you look at it, India is not really a cookie market. India is a mobile-first, app-first market. So I think relying on data sources which are more device ID, app ID based, I think is an area where less is happening right now. and i see that uh, while still a lot of ease is there because you've built historical data what you need to realize is that a customer of today is not really on the mobile browser and even if he is on the he or she is on the browser it's become increasingly difficult in terms of uh, what you can do with the cookie so i think uh, building a greater apographic graph of users or the device id graph of users or working with platforms which are allowing you to do that i think is an opportunity which is uh, under leveraged at most most places right now and uh, why i say it's under leveraged because uh, largely advertising should be where the consumer is and if the consumer is on the app whereas advertising intelligence is on the pc browser then clearly there is no meeting point and uh, so i think that's one the second area which i look at it the third is largely around uh, the offline online linkage of audiences i think we've talked enough on that i think that's an area of opportunity where a lot more needs to be done and i think a lot more will evolve because also what's happening what we need to realize is that while mobile is one connected device there are multiple other connected devices also which are connecting which are capturing many signals so whether it is your voice assistant uh, at home or your, your uh, whatever the Uh, Amazon Echo or your watch, smart watch. There are many connected devices, and ensuring that you can have a greater device or a user persona through their entire journey becomes quite important. Where both offline and uh, online footprints uh, will play a role. And if I was to just go a dip a uh, bit further, there I think also areas which I see as uh, under penetrated opportunities, given how consumers have moved. to digital video and uh, digital audio and uh, again while there are all agencies doing things around programmatic audio around connected tv i feel the consumer time spent on those devices is greater than the advertiser money spent and sometimes that could be just led by inertia and that's waiting to be disrupted in my view and uh, i see those as areas and i think finally i think there is huge amount of money which is being spent on digital and uh, that share of money every year whenever these reports come out we only see that those graphs are at least one graph which makes us smile even in these pandemic times when the overall advertising industry has seen an impact i think the digital part is at least which brings you some solace of hope and when there is disproportionate amount of spends in some categories it may still be 20 30% but in certain categories 90% of the spends are digital measuring roi and incrementality together i think is very very important and advertisers who can do that who will be able to do that or agencies who are doing that i think we'll see 
greater value creation because this is not an also ran media this is now the most dominant media on most of your advertisers so i think that's largely area so just quick recap i think the world garden part i feel is an area which is there the changing consumer landscape with new devices and footprint of online offline so many many things there while many are happening i think these are all under indexed opportunities in my view and uh, clearly i think any kind of emerging industry has uh, certain under indexing in its early days but uh, even when we talk to the big agency groups today i think today most of the conversations at least have started evolving into these areas which i think is the right direction people are thinking and talking that and i am sure the actions in 2021 will speak uh, greater in terms of disproportionate share uh, going in in these areas and consumers will keep evolving i'm sure there'll be far more number of shoppers uh, online but at least there'll be some uh, semblance of the indexing of ad spend versus time spent of consumers absolutely i think this 2020 has been a year where we've seen massive digital transformation uh, in in a lot of forms happening so i'm sure all these opportunities are really gold nuggets that will get utilized better in 2021 so uh, we've spoken a lot about programmatic data and you know all all the important stuff and all the tech stuff so let me ask you a fun question and noelia this one comes to you um, if there is one advice that you have to give to your 2012 self uh what would that be i think 2020 has been a year of reflection also everyone thought very deeply about themselves so what is that one advice that you would want to give the 2012 self you're on mute uh, noelia you're on mute sorry i uh i was i was saying that i was very naive um back in all of us uh, back in 12, back in 2012 yeah when i when uh, when we started media smart i think i think the 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 main thing is that i used to think when i started that that all we had to focus on was making campaigns effective right that that's that's all and as long as we just focused on making those campaigns effective on mobile devices we would be golden and i realized it was not uh, so much about that as about many other things um and and i think the specific advice would be never to underestimate the the power of of the incentives and the inertia in the market right because i i i was very very optimistic again uh yeah if, if our system works and 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 delivers results then then that's all we need but uh but if the if the incentives in the market are not the right ones that's not what people care about right so often in the performance uh, and digital world where everybody measures roi it's all become about what you measure how many conversions you count right and and then in many cases it's not so much about the as uh, anuj was saying about the causality effect between the ad and the conversion right which is you know i uh, i was more about how do i get this ad to convince the user to use the service right and in a world in which it's all about counting that is not what is important so with time i realized that uh, you know there there are things that became difficult in the market because not everybody was playing the game that i thought uh, was being played right <laughs> and then, and then yeah there's also the inertia of uh, you know things are done this way and you come with something that is disruptive that it's we think better and brings more value but that, that's just not how i do things so uh i think i underestimated those two things and uh and uh i i've learned so we've all learned and it's been it's been a wonderful journey i would say in the digital space and we all blessed to be in this space i would say uh anuj what advice would you give to your 2010 self wow. when when atex started and you were on the <laughs> I wasn't thinking of that answer. I thought that you were going with different questions, so I'll get a different one. And now you've put me on the spot in terms of what <laughs> I would uh, advise uh, 2010 self. I think one is that uh, never make a vision 2020 because the way 2020 has shaped in, <laughs> no, no vision document of any company would have predicted uh, uh, where 2020 is going to be. So, <laughs> but i think on a more uh, personal note i think uh, professionally uh, i think thankfully things have been good uh, we've been progressing well we've seen the industry evolve uh, 
sometimes a bit frustrating. I think as Noelia was also saying, you expect things which are intuitive to be adapted fast, but uh, it's just inertia. And uh, experience teaches you that you can't uh, like you can't push the wall. You can just like you can't uh, break it. You can just keep pushing it. So I think uh, that's where uh, thing is. But I think on a personal level, if I was to just go back ten years, I think in the last ten years I've spent significant amount of time traveling. I've spent like almost fifty, sixty percent of my time traveling, and I have lived twenty twenty with no travel beyond uh, one visit to the Media Smart <laughs> Spain team. It was pre pandemic. Yeah. But uh, there has been no other travel, and I have realized that there is so much more productivity which can be had. And it's not that uh, Zoom and Google Meets didn't exist pre-pandemic, but uh, we were not using it as efficiently as we use them right now. So I think, uh, and what could I have done with that time, like which is largely going in airport lounges, etc. So I think uh, I feel investing that time in uh, upgrading oneself with new learnings, traveling to. Uh, like traveling not from just uh, doing meetings because meetings can well be had like this but uh, traveling to just uh, experience more cultures so i think uh, spending saving some of that time and uh, using it meaningfully to upgrade yourself as a professional with uh, more uh, trainings and uh, reading and uh, personally through more experiences with travel so i think uh, do it is uh, some of the key things but uh, never make a vision 2020 document and my <laughs> goal is don't make it for 2030 also given the uh, way things are evolving i don't know where we are headed to so <laughs> let's, stay let's stay optimistic about this i think both of you spoke about inertia and i think 2020 was a year where a lot of people broke through that inertia because mm -hmm. yeah. it, it was so you know we weren't thriving we were just trying to survive and i think that is what was needed. So good luck, good luck with this partnership and really excited to see where this heads 2021. Okay. Yes. I would say thank you so much for your time, Noelia. And I know I think this was a wonderful conversation. So many learnings. And, uh, you know, we look forward to a great 2021 with both of you. And hopefully we meet in person as well uh, at, at Tech 2021. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Thanks so much. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.